So today we have the pleasure of having Elisabetta Aurino visiting us from uh, University of Barcelona, although she's been to several places before, Imperial College and uh, also Oxford, um, before uh, taking this appointment at the uh, at, um, University of Barcelona, she was also she also had a visiting position at Pupel Fabra. She does a lot of work in development, especially in, uh, in, in Ghana, and she's also very good uh, uh, getting funding <laughs> to run all these experiments. And today she's going to uh, um, tell us about uh, a field experiment, um, remote field experiment, uh, uh, on education and uh, messaging in Ghana. So, uh, all the rest of being here. Thank you so much, Susanna, for the invitation. and. Very nice to meeting you. Uh, thanks for, for coming to this talk. So this is joint work with my colleague Sharon Wolf, uh, who is a psychologist, a developmental psychologist at the University of Pennsylvania. And I changed the title uh, since the last time we talked because I have been working on the paper more. Um, yeah, it's very helpful actually to have seminars to so go back to the paper and, <laughs> and advance. And you will understand in a moment why um, it's called this way. Uh, because our story is really about inequality. And uh, um, before we go into the, the actual topic of the paper, I just thought to give you a little bit of background um, in the, of the context in which we are working. So this is, our, uh, this is data from the World Bank, UNICEF and UNESCO. And um, this chart shows the proportion of kids that the, at the end of primary school, so after five or six years in school, still cannot read a very basic sentence, things like, the sun is hot, okay? And um, at global level, and when I'm talking global in this case, is low and middle income context, this proportion uh, was 50% just before the pandemic. So <coughs> after five, six years of school, the average child in low and middle income countries uh, cannot read a simple sentence. And the same is like doing a simple math um, operation. And with the pandemic, of course, things got worse, as we know even uh, here or in, in Europe in general. And this proportion has gone to 70%. And in Sub-Saharan Africa, that is, um, uh, I mean, the, the broader context in which I work, uh, this proportion is uh, unfortunately much higher. So it was 80% before the pandemic, and now the recent estimates go up to 90%. Okay. And this is despite the fact that uh, during the two first decades of the 2000s, there have been um, immense improvements in the proportion of kids that went to school. Okay? So in Africa, for instance, we moved from 50% to 80%. And in Ghana, where I work, it's uh, almost universal primary enrollment. So all the kids, they did a massive work in getting finally kids into schools. But as the data were coming in, there was soon the recognition that these kids are not learning much. Okay? Um, and so, a few years ago, given this data that uh, we're all showing the same depressing pattern, whether it was India or Ghana or um, Brazil, um, af um, there was this uh, global education advisory panel that put together <coughs> experts in education, global policies and education, and started to look at um, existing evidence on what works uh, to make kids learn. Okay, so there are there has been a massive um, expansion of fields experiment in education in, uh, and also non-experimental studies. But, um, and so this, uh, this advisory panel started to put, to look at what um, improved kids' um, educational outcomes and also started to compare with the costs uh, of doing so. In sort of in kind of cost effectiveness analysis that health economists do, for instance. And they started to rank um, intervention from the cheapest and most effective to the, the most expensive and not, not very effective. And they concluded that uh, the only great buy, so the most cost effective thing that you could do to improve a little bit educational outcomes in this context is, is this m messaging approaches. So sending messages to parents, to teachers, or to kids, uh, giving them tips to improve education or talking about um, attendance of children, and this has been shown that uh, could be pretty effective. Of course, what I want to say here is that I don't think this is a si mm, silver bullet that works to fix this problem, but it could be a very cheap 
uh, complement to also what you do in the classroom, okay? And however, when I started to look at the literature um, that on which this was based, actually there is very limited evidence from very rural uh, contexts in sub-Saharan Africa. So just one of the ten studies that exist was done in a very rural context. Most studies were done in uh, Latin America, like in Brazil and Chile, um, and there are a few studies in sub-Saharan Africa, but where parents are quite literate, so very different context from what, where I will work and I will show you in a moment. And then there are other gaps in this evidence. One is the equity impacts. So do these things work uh, better or worse for some uh, specific groups? And then the mechanisms, why these things work, what change uh, based on sending these messages. And basically, this is the contribution we do in the we try to do in this paper. Um, so we use a program that was already tested and was effective uh, in Brazil and Cote d'Ivoire, um, and we we adapted to the context of Ghana during the pandemic. So there was uh, when schools closed, everyone was trying to think uh, of what to do, no, to support kids um, uh, learning while at home, and, and so uh, we. <coughs> we this project in which we're basically we took a program that was already tested in two contexts and was working and uh, we adapted to the rural Ghana context and um, so this program sends uh, SMS like simple SMS no WhatsApp like old school <laughs> SMS to parents with suggestions of activities that they can do with their kids to support their education and these activities are not um, academic okay there are more things like um, have you asked your child how their day went? Have you talked um, uh, about educational plans for the future? Or um, have you made sure that the, your child has enough time to study over the course of the day? So things like that that don't require, in principle, any uh, academic knowledge about, uh, from the parents. And then since uh, we know that from previous evidence that like big macroeconomic shocks, like for instance the, Sierra, uh, the Ebola crisis in Sierra Leone, or any big shock, income shock, uh, could affect worse, um, could affect more girls' education um, in terms of dropout or teenage pregnancy. We also um, uh, um, created um, a version of the program that is focused on girls specifically to raise awareness, particularly around uh, uh, issues of girls' education, and we call this the gender boost. And basically, we test um, this program. And by looking at the average effects and distributional effects and also the mechanisms um, through our household randomized trial in five regions of Ghana uh, with um, <coughs> around 2,600 households and two kids per household because we really wanted to look at gender and age heterogeneity uh, within the household. Um, so, why we focus on parents? Well, uh, we know from uh, evidence from really all across the world um, that parents are really a critical input to child educational outcomes, okay? Starting from the early years, when parents interact uh, with kids, to going towards, um, yeah, all the kind of academic uh, uh, trajectory of kids. And in fact, this is uh, one of the pillars, if you look at any educational policy worldwide, one of the key pillars of educational systems is really getting parents more involved in children's education. However, um, this involvement is often limited and is often very unequal based on the socioeconomic strata of the, of the parents. And this is true again everywhere uh, in the world. And to give an example of Ghana, um, uh, in this setting, uh, this was a survey done before the pandemic uh, in the same regions in which we work um, and was focused on young kids, okay, zero to five. And uh, um, only 13 percent of parents reported to do any stimulating activity like um, playing with your child or um, singing to your child in the in the previous two days. So already at a very early age, uh, this engagement uh, uh, seems to be limited. And of course, as I mentioned you, um, before, there are big um, inequalities also in this setting. However, this uh, low um, involvement clashes with very high educa educational aspirations of parents, okay? So in, in a lot of surveys that ask about uh, what are your, your aspirations for your child education, parents really value edu education as a key um, route out of poverty, so they have uh, high aspirations. 
And so how do we reconcile these high aspirations uh, versus this lower involvement? Well, of course, there, is a, um, there are resource barriers, okay? So time, income are, are, key, are key barriers for parents to engage, or so if you think about buying books for, for school or uh, tuitions and so on. And in fact, there is a huge literature um, in development economics trying to see uh, what happens if you alleviate these resources. Think about cash transfers, or school meals, or um, giving grants for buying uniforms um, and books to kids, okay? So there is a big literature there. Um, but what is uh, more limited is a literature around um, tackling behavioral barriers, okay? So there are, um, there are uh, things that parents could do, but they don't do because of some behavioral biases, okay? Um, so, uh, one of these could be that uh, parents, especially in this context where food insecurity is extensive, poverty, and also, of course, we were working during the COVID crisis, which was a period of even more increased stress. So, um, parents may have low, limited salience of education in their minds when they need to deal with all these other very basic things, okay? So, um, they, they may... Um, see uh, education as something they would like to invest more, but they don't have really the cognitive bandwidth uh, to deal with. And this is particularly true for educational outcome, uh, educational investments that have um, high costs uh, in the in the short run in terms of uh, time or even yeah bandwidth uh, to deal with, and they have returns in the in the in the longer run. Another issue uh, that has been identified in the literature, particularly the qualitative uh, literature, is that parents, uh, in many cases, are they didn't go to school themselves. So, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, the, it's, it is really in the past 20 years that we get this wave of kids into school. And so they may not know actually what to do, uh, what, what is important for your child development. Um, and also, um, this, for instance, this paper that is from a different context is Peru, but it really shows how uh, parents get also limited guidance from schools on, on what to do to support um, their kids' education. So the program that we tested was also trying to give some guidance in this sense. And then a key issue, especially in, in this context where we work, it may be gender bias. So investing in girls' education may be perceived as a, um, an investment with lower returns compared to, um, to boys, and there may be other things that may, um, that may uh, refrain parents from doing so. Um, and of course, these barriers, these behavioral <coughs> barriers may be larger for uh, low, so, low, uh, lower educated parents uh, and can be exacerbated by crisis. <coughs> um, and so we test basically if by um, kind of alleviating, uh, hopefully alleviating these barriers, we can have an effect on what parents do, okay? So in terms of research question, we ask whether these SMS nudges, so these were uh, two SMS sent uh, per week, okay? And I will show you an example uh, later on, increase our three primary outcomes, which are uh, parental educational engagement, so the activities that parents do with their kids to get closer to their school lives, uh, and then re-enrollment, because we were worried that, so in Ghana school closed for one year, so we were worried that given these big um, uh, school sh uh, shutdowns, actually people will not show up again. Um, and then attendance, which is a problem uh, in general. And then, uh, as a secondary, more distal outcomes, we, we, we weren't really uh, hopeful that could this very simple nudges could change literacy, numeracy, and social emotional skills, and so we saw we saw this kind of a more distal outcomes as a product of going to school more or uh, attending more. And then uh, we look at whether these effects vary by uh, parental gender and parental schooling, and then by child gender and age, okay? And what are the potential mechanisms for this? So, what do we find? Well, nothing. <laughs> oh. Yes. So these are average effects. So this is a plot that shows you both uh, if, if we ask to kids themselves or we ask to parents to be kind of uh, sure because maybe if you ask to parents they may have been uh, prompted to, to tell a better picture. So we ask to both. Um, 
we, we find nothing on our three primary outcomes, okay? So there is no effect uh, in anything. And, and then when we look at our uh, pre-specified axis of heterogeneity, so parental gender, mm -hmm. maybe if the parent is a woman or, or a man that received the messages, things may vary, nothing. Uh, if it's a, a 5 to 9 child versus 10, 17, nothing. Um, if we look at uh, whether the child is a boy or a girl, nothing. Even if we wanted that the, the gender boost arm was targeting the girls in particular, so we were hoping that um, that would be more effective for girls, nothing. So what is the only thing that seems to matter here is parental exposure to any form of schooling. So, depending on whether the parents have, have, have ever been to school or not, uh, we see completely diverging effects, okay? So for parents that have never been to school, that in this case is the very vast majority of this sample, and we didn't expect that uh, no form of schooling was so high, because in general in Ghana it's, uh, it's lower. We, we picked a very, very deprived sample in a way. Uh, so 60%, 66% of parents have never put their foot into school. Actually, the nudges uh, um, have a backfiring effect. So just receiving this text uh, made them disengage from, from, from their, school, their child educational activities. So they do less and they, the kids go less to school. Okay, so a really negative effect. Yes, which was too very depressing to, to see because our theory of change was really to empower parents, to give them tools to, to engage, especially the most vulnerable ones. For the parents that uh, add some schooling, so <laughs> and in this case I'm, I'm not talking about PhDs, I'm talking at primary school, so some years of primary, in most cases, actually things go in the expected direction. So they do more um, and... and um, there is more attendance, but nothing is really significant in terms of uh, coefficients. But then when we look at our secondary outcomes, for the parents that had some schooling, some formal schooling exposure, actually their kids have higher social-emotional skills at the end. So, and these skills uh, measure the feelings of support uh, that kids have and uh, skills related to conflict resolution. So in this case, actually, the program seemed to be working in the way we wanted because p uh, children feel more supported. So this was really the, the, the goal. Uh, and also, uh, for the kids in the adult class arm, the standard arm, there is also more literacy. Um, uh, but no effects for the kids uh, with no schooling. Okay. So yes. So these results are compared to parents with some schooling who did not participate in the program. No, uh, are, are, are uh, against the control. So this is the plotted effect size of being assigned to either of the two arms um, by whether the parents have some schooling or not. Okay, right. so these so are effect size compared compar to the control. The control will be the, the ones who did the, not We did not, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. 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 We never receive any, any text. Mm -hmm. So there were improvements in social emotional skills and some kind of signal of improvements uh, in uh, literacy score. So for, the, for having this very basic level of uh, human capital seems to be um, affecting positively the functioning of the nudges, but if you don't have this basic level, things go even like in an opposite direction, okay? When we look at mechanisms, we, I will talk more about mechanisms, and then we did a qualitative sub-study to really understand this more in depth, but um, in general, we see the same, uh, the same pattern. So for the parents with no schooling, every p potential mechanism that we thought, like uh, their self-efficacy, so their, their beliefs in their ability to be effective in supporting the kids' education decrease, and gender bias increase, um, aspiration decrease, so everything went bad, okay? Um, whilst, so this is just with the parental self-efficacy and this is with stress in red. With the parents with some schooling, they had an increase in stress. So by receiving the nudges, it feels that they, they were nudged to do more, so they felt more stress, but at least this stress uh, translated in more activities that they did with their kids, okay? Mm -hmm. So we have this very, um, 
diverging effects in the mechanisms as well. Okay, so in terms of contribution to the literature, as I mentioned you, we contribute to our literature um, in behavioral, um, in the behavioral science that is focused uh, on uh, targeting pow uh, parents with this kind of um, digital or uh, messaging programs to support child education. So there is a lot, for instance, in high income countries, uh, and there is a lot of evidence there that this approaches work, especially for low-income parents. And as I mentioned bef uh, before, um, there is uh, evidence from middle-income countries. And again, these things seem to be work. And so we contribute by really giving evidence on a very uh, rural and um, low literacy uh, setting. And then um, we also contribute, so that during COVID, there were a lot of these sort of digital programs that were tried, because of course, uh, it's a very cheap, it's very easy to employ fast, and so di in different settings, similar approaches have been tested. And what is the evidence is kind of um, the body of evidence that is coming out from this work um, shows that actually inequalities by socioeconomic status are all increasing by this, which is consistent also with what we saw in general with the pandemic for education, inequalities increased a lot based on whether parents could help uh, while kids were at home. Um, and in terms of mechanism, this paper by uh, Sofia Amaral and co-authors, co this is from El Salvador, again during the COVID crisis, they sent digital, uh, it was a digital program that was effective in person, but then they translated in digital to make it uh, work during COVID, and in this case they find the same uh, negative effects, some backfiring effects with increasing stress and increasing violence against children, even. So it seems that there is something <laughs> with the digital, especially in a, in a time of heightened stress, that doesn't work. Um, and basically, one takeaway is this targeting is really key. You cannot think of these approaches to be the great buy for everyone, because it doesn't work really well for everyone. Okay. Um, and then also we contribute to the Nudges literature, because what we find is that the effects, uh, we have a midline data, we have a collection that we, um, we implemented after three months that the program was running, and we already see that these diverging effects basically start immediately. So already at three months of implementation, they are there, and they stick. So even after six months, when the program finished, they are still there, which is kind of new in the nudges literature, because usually we think about nudges as something that kind of short term, that changes the choice architecture in the short term, but doesn't stick. But in this case, actually, unfortunately, they stick, okay? Um, uh, and then also we contribute to, to this literature by showing these backfiring effects, okay? Um, okay. So in terms of study context, so I, I talked about the general learning crisis in uh, low and middle income countries. In Ghana is a good um, context because it, it does what a lot of the challenges that are, are common in, in for instance, sub-Saharan Africa and in West Africa in particular. So in general, low, uh, there is low learning. So kids are in school for five, six years of primary and most of them get out from primary and cannot read uh, or do very simple arithmetics. And there are wide inequalities by gender and socioeconomic status. And as I said before, uh, schools were closed for one year. Um, and we know from our baseline data that during the school closures, there was limited remote learning engagement. So kids were not really doing much uh, whilst they were um, at home. Um, and, uh, and also there was, as um, in many, I guess all around the world, there were increasing poverty, okay, with the COVID shock and food insecurity. This, where we work, is mostly rural, and so in this case, there were a lot of loss of remittances, that people that were migrating uh, were sending back since, yeah, so there was a lot of uh, loss of remittances. And actually, whilst we were doing field work, uh, um, there were also floodings, so there are a lot of crises coming together at the same time. So the intervention, um, so this is uh, this EduPlus program. This was um, devised by a startup, that uh, kind of social startups, I don't know how they're called this, um, that works in Brazil. And they do a lot of these behavioral programs uh, for education and uh, public policies in general. And basically they tested in Brazil and Cote d'Ivoire, 
and it seems to be working. So Sharon, that my collaborator, uh, tested uh, this program in Cote d'Ivoire and when mess these messages were sent to parents, actually learning increased. Okay, so we thought, okay, Cote d'Ivoire <coughs> is the neighbor of Ghana, maybe it's gonna work. Um, so these are bi-weekly SMS with uh, information and suggestions of activities you could do with your child. Um, no academic knowledge was needed and um, it's very cheap at the end of the day because it's the cost of SMS. This is seven uh, US dollars because we also paid MOVA, this, this company, but it, if it was working then it would have been very cheap to scale up no? because the program was already there. Um, so our innovation were uh, to work with NGOs working in, in Ghana, to, um, in, in education in northern Ghana, to kind of adapt the contents and, and pick the topics that were most salient to this context. And then we added this gender boost arm, so making um, the education of the girls particularly uh, prominent for some parents. So half of the parents got the Edu Plus and half got the, the gender boost. And uh, we also played uh, with the, the program exposure. So how, um, some households got three months exposure and other households got six months because we wanted to see whether different uh, um, timing of exposure made any difference. And it didn't. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's really schooling in this case. So just to give an example, uh, so in each um, sequence of, a, of the SMS is about one topic, okay? Sorry, maybe it's a bit small. Uh, so in this case, uh, it was about making time for kids uh, to study, to make some homework at home, okay? Um, and so usually a sequence is, um, is, uh, it starts with a motivating fact that says, uh, I don't know, maybe uh, it's important for kids to have time to, to focus on their study. And then in the second SMS in the week, uh, follows with a suggestion of activities that uh, they could do. And then in the second week, there is an interactivity message uh, that kind of tries to spur reflection how this activity went or what could, could be improved. And then the, the, the sequence closes with a growth message that kind of reiterates re the, the initial idea. Okay? And the, the, the topics were, yeah, this is really to chores. Uh, but they were talking more like talking about um, with the kids at the end of the day, explain how your day went, uh, let them tell you uh, what, uh, what happened in their day, or talking about educational plans uh, for the future, things like that. So nothing really kind of academically uh, per se. For the gender boost, um, it was basically the same contents, but just making daughters more prominent, or talking about girls and boys, or, or like here and here, think about the instruction your daughter may face, okay? But very similar contents. So with, the, with regards to the, the design of the study, so we draw, we started uh, during the, 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 the pandemic, and so we enrolled household by phone. And so we draw from households from the Ghana Panel Survey, that is a, mm. yeah, a panel survey uh, in Ghana, so half of the sample comes from there, and half came from another study that was completed five years before, so we basically had the num I mean, our partner um, had the numbers of this household, and they were recontacted, and we asked whether they wanted to be part of the study. Uh, and so basically we got these households uh, and then within each household we sampled two kids because we wanted to know um, this variation by age and gender, okay? And uh, we then randomized this household to five arms. So we had, um, the first arm was the standard program for three months. Then the second arm is the gender boost for three months. And then the, the third and fourth are the standard and the gender boost for a longer exposure, six months, okay? And then we have the control. And then um, we surveyed these people over two rounds mm -hmm. in person, in this case, because the restrictions, um, the restriction went away, so we, we, we were serving them outside with masks and so on. Uh, but we, we were really, um, uh, yeah, we, we were lucky to, to get very low attrition, so we, all, all, we managed to recon, uh, recontract um, the most households, okay? 
but still all the estimates I show you here are from the panel, the people that we are always observe. Um, so this is the timeline. So when we, we, when we think about this project, our plan was to have um, part of the messages to run during the school closures. Um, and then as school would reopen, we were hoping that the longer exposure were kind of also having uh, part of the messages during the school reopening, okay, to have this variation. But that didn't happen because we had massive delays in starting and so on. So at the end we started the, when schools were about to reopen. So our first message was actually uh, a message saying, hi, uh, the schools are reopening next week, make sure you enroll your child again. Um, and then we have the, the midline uh, after the first batch of households, the three months implementation end, and then the end line uh, um, that was conducted two months after the, the long exposure uh, ended, and six months after the short ended, in, uh, because it was in August and, and September um, 2021. So just to give you, uh, so the, the sample is balanced, so the randomization made uh, comparable groups on average. Uh, what I want to, to highlight is that, first of all, these are um, pretty big households, so it's like uh, around 10 people in the household. Um, these are uh, most um, caregivers don't have, never went to school, so only 35% went to school. Um, and um, they, yeah, then we look at gender bias and other, and other characteristics of uh, this household. This is baseline, okay? But yeah, these are pretty much um, balanced arms. So can I ask you a question? So if sure. there are so, so few people who ever attended uh, the school, can mm -hmm. they read themselves? Yeah, that's, <laughs> we didn't, so when we were designing the study, we, we really had a lot of debates on whether doing SMS or audio, uh -huh. okay? And at the end, because in the Codi were study, they did the SMS and audio and didn't find any effect, any differential effectiveness in both. So we said, okay, since Ghana in general is more literate than Cote d'Ivoire, we said, well, so if this doesn't change in Cote d'Ivoire, we have higher literacy rate, we'll do SMS because they are more nimble. Because we said, okay, we want to have a, an intervention that if, for instance, sc uh, schools close again, we can adapt very quickly the messages that say schools are closing, uh, be aware, you know. Um, but, but, uh, but yeah, we didn't expect a sample with such high illiteracy rates. And the other question uh, about the experiment is, uh, but mm, as I understand it, there is no way to check whether how the parents are reacting to these messages, right? Because it's not that they have to, uh, there is like a like an exit um, question or something, right? So at the beginning, the interactivity question, they could respond free of charge to the, to the program, uh -huh. but then, uh, it was a mess to set up a number that they could respond. It took months and months, and at the end, we didn't manage to. But yeah, so we know from <coughs> if they reacted based on the parental engagement right, questionnaire, right? right? Uh, but yeah, yeah. In the end, it's almost like intention to treat. No? See, see, this yeah. is intention to treat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's whether we send you the messages and uh, yeah. yeah, we I, I want to, to see treatment on the treated by maybe look at some implementation measures, but yeah, no, it's intent to treat. Mm -hmm. So it's like, just this message arrives in your phone, what happens? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we know that people ask to other people to read the messages. If they were not, uh, so we have a question of whether, what, if, if they read it themselves, or if they ask, if not, if what happened, some never read. Um, and some others asked, uh, I don't know, the neighbor or even the children themselves, like maybe the older siblings to read. Uh, and that could be one of the, the problems, that maybe the way that people read it and translate, like the, the message can change, right? So that could be a problem that we have for this very negative the, the effects. Other, uh, another comment that I have is mm -hmm. if those, um, uh, those, those, those questions that you uh, show us were the real ones, they seem also like pretty general, right? Um, the they parental engagement. Yes, no, I mean, I get that message and I have no idea what to do with my children. You know right. What I mean? No? 
Yeah. You know, like uh, go and I don't know and, and, and make a little arts and crafts with a uh, yeah. piece of space or something like that. Right. Like that is very general kind of. Yeah. I mean that you know. was like give time because we know household chores. Kids spend a lot of time in household chores and labor, so that was more like make time for their child to study in between the household chores. But I agree, honestly, now going back, I would do the messages and you know, I would write it in a different way. We, we took this program, we were, uh, yeah, we took what was already tested and we thought it was working, mm -hmm. and we, we should have done a better job in the, in the writing of the messages. Now I would do it. Well, I don't know what is there, but I mean. No, no, but I think uh, there is scope for improvements. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. But there's only one by curiosity. Uh, what, what means per boy by the score? Ah, th that is a scale that has been validated uh, um, and basically measures the agreement of the person to some statements related to gender inequality. Like, uh, uh, um, my the education is less important for my daughter than my oh. my child, my boy. Yes or no, and then things like that, um, and aggregated into a scale. Okay. And um, another question, um, maybe I missed. No, no, no. You know, explain, but uh, so the idea is that you you start you motivated the experiment about this group of uh, of students that they barely can write and read basic sentences. So at the end, the experiment is run to this specific group of people or to everyone? No, to everyone in this sample. So we yeah. know that in this in this sample, people don't read them right well, the kids, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, but this, uh, that was general data from, from Sub-Saharan Africa. Because in my case, for instance, mm -hmm. if you have these uh, two groups, students that have a kind of a normal learning, mm -hmm. so, uh, for the Ghana standards, or and then you have these uh, students that have low, very, very low achievement. Well, the first thing I would do is <coughs> just to run a probe just to see which are the characteristics of those that. Right. So the question is do you have this information? So the problem is 90% of these kids are low achievers because they cannot read a, a very, very simple but, sentence. But you mean 90% of the, of the school population or? Yeah, I mean there are data from the Ghana uh, Ministry of Education that shows the, the proficiency. I, I think it was... So 90% of the children in the system yes. under, underperform? Yes. What is supposed to be done? Yes. Oh. Yeah, it's depressing. <laughs> yeah. But and it's not only Ghana. Eh? Like, uh, if Cote I, I, I did down India, are the same. But Cote d'Ivoire had a positive effect, is the same the statistics? Yeah, I mean, generally, there is a problem with learning. So kids, for, and then there is a literature on why is that so, kids are in school and they learn in school anything after five, six years. And that is not just Ghana. Uh, the first to show this were in India, were very similar. Like maybe in grade four, they cannot. 20% uh, of kids cannot read letters. Okay, so it's a general <coughs> problem of educational systems in global south. Yeah, the question was to be more precise to the target group, but if the target group is the whole population. Then so no, yeah, no. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we have the scores, test scores of these kids. Yeah. Um, how am I doing with time? Uh, yeah, because they have 15, 20 minutes. Oh, okay. Okay. So in terms of primary outcome, so we have this parental engagement in education that is measured with uh, both the parents and the kids. And this is a scale that is developed by UNICEF that runs this uh, multiple indicator cluster surveys. There are surveys done at, um, like um, most of Africa or Asia that uh, mm. look at different issues related to child development. Okay, And so these are um, age specific because of course what you do with a zero to five kid is different from an adolescence. And so they ask a number of activities of, that parents do with kids, both at home and at school, like going to PTA meeting, like to parent teacher meetings or um, talking with the child, discussing educational plans, and so on. And then we have uh, enrollment and attendance, both parent and child reported. In terms of more secondary out distal outcomes, we have uh, literacy, maths, and social emotional skills. And I'm sorry, I didn't, the, I didn't include the, the chart with the descriptives. 
but there are for literacy, for instance, uh, most kids are in the zero. They don't get even one question right. Okay, so there is a major floor effect. And this were again where we did age appropriate, so we did assessments that were um, related to the age and social emotional skills. And then we look at different mechanisms, so this parental self-efficacy, that is a scale developed by psychologists uh, related to your perceived efficacy in supporting your child education, uh, distress, uh, then the educational aspiration and expectation, so how much parents uh, would like their children to achieve and how much they think they will actually achieve in, in reality, and then this pro-boy bias uh, scale that uh, measure attitudes toward gender equality. And so basically, in most cases, except for enrollment and attendance, which we use kind of binary, so whether the child uh, is in school or whether he's attending uh, most days in the previous week, um, these are binary variable, all the rest are uh, Z scores. We aggregated it and then uh, we, we, have, um, we standardized it. So with, with regards to the empirical strategy, given it's um, a randomized trial, it's pretty straightforward. We compare being exposed to uh, either treatment, so the EDU plus or the gender boost, so in an in intent to treat approach um, with the control, okay? And we focus on the comparison between uh, the two programs rather than the time, like the ex exposure length uh, in main analysis that I show you because we don't find any difference anyway, so to simplify, um, and on the outcomes, okay? So, just to go back to re the results, so this is um, what I showed you at the beginning, uh, but with the actual coefficients. Um, basically, whether we look at parents <coughs> or children reports, we don't find any average effect, okay, of being exposed to this program, okay? Nothing changes in terms of engagement, enrollment, and attendance. Um, and as I said, there is no difference by whether the parent is a mother or a father. We have half-half in this um, half of half, half, half received the messages. We don't have any effects by child, gender, and age, and no effects by duration length. But we have this, um, this large heterogeneity by whether the parents had some exposure to formal schooling. Okay? So the coefficients for the interaction um, are positive and significant for uh, the engagement. And, in, and the, the coefficient for the child report, in this case, we only focus on the reports of kids 10 to 17 because 5 to 9 were too noisy, like kids didn't report very well, they were too small. But you can see that, in general, all the coefficients, even if the magnitude uh, are slightly different or the statistical significance is different, but they go, all go, they're quite consistent between parent and, and child, okay? So there is this pattern across all the three indicators that um, for the parents that never had schooling, uh, things go worse with the program, and with the parents that had some schooling, things improve uh, a bit. Okay, and so this is the chart I showed you uh, before. Um, yeah, so these negative effects, when we plot this uh, interaction uh, coefficients, we see these negative effects on engagement and attendance for the parents with no education, and um, effects that go towards positive, although they're not significant, for the parents with some schooling. With, the, with regards to the secondary outcomes, for the, uh, for the average child, actually we find uh, an improvement in social emotional skills. But then when we kind of disaggregate again by looking at the interaction, uh, this is really driven by the parents with high, um, educa high education, I mean with some education. Um, and, uh, and this is the, the plot I showed you before. And so, what the next step is why why this is happening okay so we find these uh, results what is going on there so the first thing is to ask what, in which ways these parents are different okay so this is just descriptively showing um, uh, differences in these two groups two groups of parents so uh, and these are actually different different types of parents okay so parents that have uh, never be been to school are more likely to be the primary caregiver for the kids. 
they are slightly older, uh, they live in bigger households, um, they have slightly more kids in school age, they have a higher return. So we asked about returns to education, they, how much, for instance, they think completing primary, secondary, and university will make in terms of returns. And they actually have higher return, uh, expected returns. So they, it's not that they don't care about education, they actually think that education will give them more um, returns, in theory. Uh, they're more likely to have gender unequal ideas. Um, um, and yeah. And they were, uh, the kids were doing much less at baseline in terms of remote learning. So, yes? No, just uh, given that you use all the students and you have these small effects, could it be that those that take more benefit from this intervention are those that already perform better than the rest? The problem is that I don't have. Uh, yes, I I, I take your point. Because then yeah. it means it means that obviously it's doing something. Yeah. But would just to the I mean, it would be effective not for the target group. Yeah. But for the other. Exactly. Yeah. That's basically so. what I found. Yeah, I can't really do what you suggest because at baseline, since it was our phone interview, we mm -hmm. didn't collect uh, the performance, the educational performance of the kids. Uh, by phone. We only did it later uh, in person. So by phone we only asked things up to the parent about their families. Um, so I cannot test that directly, but probably since there is a correlation between parental schooling and achievement, well, what you say is, is probably right. That this is the case. Yes, yeah. So it's really exactly what you say. The study is that exactly this one. So we wanted to benefit more parents with less tool to support their child education, but actually this is going completely opposite. Yeah, but this is so, I mean, if you read the literature, the literature in, in many developed countries, usually it also happens the same. But this, the, that the, 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 higher, the, the higher achievers, in general, mm -hmm. are the ones who take more benefit from most of these interventions. But even in, in Europe or other yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes, no, uh, absolutely. So, yeah, it's one of our conclusions. This is actually increasing educational inequality. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the other thing we thought was that actually education of the parents may be processing something else. So we're actually picking up uh, other stuff with this, uh, this uh, educational uh, um, indicator. And so we started, uh, we had um, we start to add interactions um, to our baseline model. So first we think, okay, maybe <coughs> education is a proxy for socioeconomic status, about wealth, uh, proxy for uh, their access to communication, if they have a TV, for instance, or uh, food security of the household. So we start to, <coughs> to augment our baseline model that is in column one with interaction between the treatment and these other things that education could proxy. And this is the second column. And really, the, the coefficients are, are pretty stable for the interaction between the nudge and some schooling. Then we also think, OK, maybe education is a proxy for uh, beliefs, right? So maybe um, parents they have more education, are more uh, um, equal, so they are more um, gender equal within the household. And so we start to add indicators related to norms uh, in the household and in the third column and nothing really changes. And then we thought, okay, maybe education, parental education is a proxy for how much they value education for their kids. So we have indicators related to um, during the school closures, if they um, bought material for kids to study or they, they called the teacher or how many hours they, they, they were, the kids were doing uh, remote learning. And by adding this, uh, this last um, uh, set of interactions, uh, we still see that there is a, a bit of a decrease between the interaction with the treatment and schooling, but still uh, it remains the same. So it seems it's really a story about human capital of the parents and not about these other things, okay? That could be proxy for, for parent education. Um, so then we look at uh, some mechanisms that we hypothesize. Uh, so, uh, as I showed you before, we look at self-efficacy mm -hmm. and distress. 
Um, and then we look at the pro boy bias because we hope that the, the gender boost arm would decrease gender uh, inequality, but actually it, it actually exacerbates it. And for the balance window schooling. Um, and so again, we see a, a very similar story as the main treatment effects. So for parents with no schooling, all these mechanisms, all these things go worse. So they, are, they feel less effective in supporting their child education, they become more gender unequal, they, they decrease their aspirations, and uh, they have lower attitudes towards uh, attendance, school attendance. So everything goes bad. And for the parents uh, with some schooling, uh, they become more stressed, <laughs> okay? So, um, so yeah, uh, so probably for the parents with any schooling, the message is kind of spur them into action in a way, okay? Mm -hmm. um, so we also dig the more, yeah. So do you have a clue because why this type of parents, why things get worse? Yeah, I, I will tell you. <laughs> I mean, I, the, my hypothesis. So we did a qualitative, so these were the mechanisms were the things we hypothesized in the analysis plan, okay, and we measured. Then uh, we, um, we did a qualitative study to really understand what was going on more in depth, okay? And uh, so we did um, this follow-up uh, uh, interviews with parents that received the program, okay? And we have three main takeaways from that. The first, is that for the parents with no education, receiving the nudges was perceived as a signal they were not good enough, okay? So it was really kind of a signaling device of they thought, like there is this, um, this last blue quote that says, uh, I believe I received the messages because they knew I was not doing enough, okay? So they felt really, and it's, it's sort of like the message is made more salient to their lack of education, okay? So this is the first uh, kind of takeaway from this analysis. And so this is really go, go back to the point of self-efficacy. They felt less effective in supporting their kids' education, okay? The second is that actually um, they felt kind of a very contrasting uh, feelings about these messages. On the one hand, they say that they, uh, they were stressful because they reminded that they should be doing more. But on the other hand, they say that they motivate them, okay? So there is kind of this dichotomy of emotions uh, by receiving these, these messages. Um, so for instance, this, this interviewer asks, so do the messages make you feel bad about your parenting? And he says, no, it actually motivated and encouraged me. Okay, so there is this kind of uh, dichotomy <coughs> going on. And the third that I think is also very interesting is that people felt this was another kind of temporary project that we land and it was not sustainable. So they felt, why should I bother um, if uh, this will end? And actually this is quite interesting because maybe, uh, so these messages were branded as Edu Plus, so the name of the program, but maybe if uh, we would have branded as Ministry of, of Education, maybe they would have been perceived as a more sustainable thing. So this is another area that we should investigate in the future, whether the branding make a change in the perception of the, the program. So basically, just to conclude, uh, one interpretation is that not just made more salient the lack of education that parents with no education have. Um, and so it was really a signal of that. And this is consistent with the, this um, social identity, uh, the, like uh, Lisha showed that, for instance, shows that if you are, um, say, a lower caste child and your caste is made public, then you perform worse in exams. So there is a lot of uh, literature around that, that when you are in a disadvantaged group and your identity is revealed, you do perform worse, okay? Or like women, there is a lot, of, yeah. There is also evidence of that in uh, Europe or the US. Um, so basically, this, this uh, may have caused parents uh, with no schooling to pull back from, from what they were doing. Um, on the other hand, for parents with some schooling, uh, actually the nudges increased stress, but they also spurred actions. They really seem that they nudged in a way, right? Um, and so basically, this is related to what you were saying, that actually this 
heterogeneity, uh, highlights that program actually are, are increased, like this program as others are increasing the educational inequalities, okay? Um, and so we, we may want to think in the future what are the, what we can do with the parents that actually need more support, what works with them. Um, because, yeah, there is this literature that is, uh, especially during COVID, has shown that actually lower SCS households are doing worse. Um, and yeah, so to conclude, uh, so this evidence showed that a very light touch, because at the end of the day it was two SMS per week, can actually change behaviors, not in the, always in the way we wanted uh, for, um, for them to change. Um, so if you have a base level of human capital, things tend to get better. Um, and also the effects uh, uh, show that they persist over time, at least for six months after the program ends. But if you don't have this basic level of human capital, actually energy is backfire. Um, and so this large heterogeneity and scores the potential of this very low cost program but it needs to be targeted well, otherwise <laughs> better avoid. Um, so, um, so yeah, so what we wanted to do in the experiment was also to collect administrative data. We had two years delay, but uh, finally we managed to go back to schools and, and collect this from the school ledgers. And then we, wa we would like to do spillover effects to see whether, because they may have, like neighbors may have read the messages, so we want to, uh, dig into that, and actually, if you have suggestions on how to best do it, uh, I, I would be really uh, grateful. And uh, yeah, if you have any other feedback, um, yeah, I'm happy to discuss. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Questions? No, if you allow me, I can give you one, one next step. Okay. That is, it's interesting. I mean, it is intriguing. Why it didn't, why it worked in yeah, Cote d'Ivoire? Why it worked? It worked in Cote d'Ivoire and not in Ghana. I you mean, know why? Uh, they were so much better off. We look back at the educational yeah. level, so they are they are flipped. So seventy percent of parents could read in Cote d'Ivoire. Mm -hmm. So yeah. this is the, the the so even. Well, then it goes more in favor of the last argument. Mm -hmm. Which that uh, is part of education. Yeah. Ah, uh, yeah, that's a good point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 you're right. Yeah, in the insight, so in Cote d'Ivoire, it was in cocoa growing uh, farms. So they were better, they were better off. They had uh, more income uh, because they, yeah, in Cote d'Ivoire, you have 90% of cocoa production, I think, in the world. So they had, they had better education. Although, as a whole, the country is worse off than Ghana. Well, we have very... They didn't split the sample between uh, parents with education or not. No. no, but you know what is interesting there? They sent uh, to an arm only the par to the parents, as we did. And then, to another group, they sent to the parents and the teachers. And when they sent to both, things backfired again. Which is also interesting. So these nudges really seem to backfire if you don't really understand the context, uh, what could uh, the response, which I think is really interesting, the responses <coughs> that they can create. Hmm. And, and then the, I guess the other issue is that in Cote d'Ivoire, this was done before pandemic. Right? Yes. So the pandemic is, was also very really stressful, right? We all were very stressed uh, yeah. with the situation. So yeah. So that, that, that's also yes. obviously. Um, yeah, it would be interesting to do like a different diff, no? Like before, after. Yeah, uh, but we can't because, uh, yeah, yeah. Mm. Is there a way that you let the parents know what is expected from them? Like mm. maybe a quick uh, call or something? Yeah, Are you going to receive an email, a text every, every, every week? Just a reminder that you have to spend time with the kids or that you have yeah, to. Yeah, that's all. Uh, so at the beginning, when we enrolled them, uh, we did. We mm -hmm. said, do you want to be part of this program? And you will if you will be randomly assigned, uh, you will be receiving text uh, to support your child education. Mm -hmm. But maybe, yeah, more follow-up. And, and more actionable messages? Yeah. And with some like, images, maybe it's easier for them? Because they don't read? Is, yeah, no? you're right, but the thing is, they don't have a smartphone. Oh, yeah. You know? So 
So yeah, because we yeah, it would be great to have all video. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. But uh, I, I, I yeah. yeah, but it's a good point. The actionable message, I think, um, for the future, mm -hmm. if we <laughs> ever. Yeah. <laughs> uh. Any more questions? No. So, yeah. Yeah. so thank you very much. Okay. So thank you very much.